Welcome to Nostalgic Medicine, a look back at the history of medicine and healthcare. Today's video is on the history of anaesthesia. Until about 150 years ago, having a surgery was a horrible experience, but this is no longer the case, largely thanks to anaesthesia. Anesthesia nowadays is achieved by using a combination of drugs that paralyze your nerves and put you to sleep before a surgery and then your vital signs are closely monitored throughout the operation to make sure that your body is stable. But the current drugs and machines used for anesthesia are relatively new inventions. So without them, how did people perform surgery in the past? The practice of surgery predates human civilization, and the idea of anesthesia is as old as surgery. We can even see it in the biblical creation story, where God removes a rib from Adam while he was in a deep sleep. And from other ancient societies, we have an abundance of evidence that they used many methods to put someone under before an operation, with examples of people either using manual techniques to knock someone out, as well as various drugs and herbal remedies. In terms of non-pharmacological methods, we have documentation from ancient Assyria, where surgeons applied pressure to both carotid arteries before an operation, which would cause a person to pass out. And there's other examples of drug-free anesthesia throughout history, including just simply giving a knockout blow to the head. And as late as the 19th century, Hypnotism was used to put people to sleep. Now the three main principles of anesthesia are sedation, pain relief and muscle relaxation, which means that if you could find a substance that affects the body in one or more of these ways, it can in theory be used as an anesthetic agent. So you won't be surprised to learn that dozens of different drugs have been used by surgeons throughout the ages in an attempt to make surgery a less traumatic experience. After looking through the many examples of Asia anesthesia, the drugs that seemed to come up a lot were cannabis, opium, and alcohol. All three of these drugs have a long history of being used recreationally, but the sedative effects have also meant that they were occasionally used by top surgeons of the time. In China during the 2nd century AD, there was a legendary surgeon called Hua Tuo who used a herbal mixture known as mafijan, and cannabis is believed to have been its main ingredient. Going forward in time to the medieval Islamic world, it became common for surgeons to soak a sponge with substances like opium and then place it over the patient's nose, a technique that was described in the famous canon of medicine. And moving west to England around the time of William Shakespeare, the mixture of choice was an alcoholic drink called Dwell, which also contained other powerful anaesthetic ingredients like mandrake, hemlock and opium. Despite the numerous documentation of the use of these substances for surgery, none of these really made their way into standard surgical practice wherever they were used. The most likely reason for this was because of the very strong religious beliefs at the time, which saw pain and suffering as a natural part of life, so any attempt to prevent it could be seen as being sinful. Surgery was also still a very imprecise field of medicine, and only used as the very last resort treatment. When it was done, the main aim of surgery was to operate as fast as possible to limit how long the pain lasts. But this would all change during the mid-19th century, as thinking became more enlightened, surgery was becoming more advanced, and anesthesia would eventually become its own specialised field of medicine. The story of modern anesthesia begins with nitrous oxide. It was first discovered in 1772, and 30 years after its discovery, an English chemist realised that it was a pain reliever and also caused him to giggle, 
so we gave it the nickname Laughing Gas. Humphrey Davy suggested all the way back in 1799 that it could be potentially used for surgeries, but it took over 40 years for someone to actually try it out. This person was Horace Wells, who was an American dentist. It happened quite by accident in 1844, when he was in the city of Hartford, Connecticut, and he was watching a live show that was demonstrating the effects of nitrous oxide when you inhaled it. One of the audience members were put under the influence of nitrous oxide during this performance and hit their leg hard against a piece of wood. The person had clear bruises and cuts to his knees from this, but he couldn't feel a thing, which led Horace Wells to see great potential in this gas. He first tested the effects of nitrous oxide in himself by getting another dentist to remove his tooth while under the influence of it, and after this was successful, he began to regularly use it on his patients in the dental practice that he owned. The next step from this was to reveal his discovery to the wider medical and dental community, and he would do it with a demonstration to medical students in Massachusetts General Hospital. He was able to do this with the help of William Morton, his former dental student and business partner, who had since moved to Massachusetts to study medicine. The demonstration took place in a large lecture room, and the student was asked to volunteer to allow the tooth to be extracted. But this turned out to be a failure, as Wells didn't administer the nitrous oxide properly this time round so the student was crying out in pain during the extraction. Even though the student remembered nothing about the events that transpired after his tooth was removed, this was nevertheless a huge embarrassment to Horace Wells, and he was dismissed as a charlatan. He would eventually fall into a severe depression, and Wells committed suicide four years after this demonstration and he did this by cutting his femoral artery after inhaling chloroform, another anaesthetic agent, which we'll get into later. But Horace Wells would end up being influential in the field of anaesthesia, as his student William Morton would build upon his work. Instead of nitrous oxide, he turned to ether as a possible agent. Ether was very popular in the early 19th century as a recreational drug, as people used to inhale it and get high in parties, which were known as ether frolics. Morton decided to test out the anaesthetic effects of ether after attending one of these parties and seeing the effects that it had on him. He did some preliminary experiments on ether which looked promising, so he decided to do what his former mentor failed to do and demonstrate the potential of anaesthesia to the world. And this would happen on October 16th, 1846, which is now known as Ether Day. Once again in Massachusetts General Hospital, a packed room of observers watched on, as Morton applied ether to a patient with a neck tumour, who slowly fell unconscious. The operating surgeon John Warren then proceeded to remove the tumour, and when the patient was awoken and asked how the surgery was, he said that all he felt was a scratch. Everyone in the room knew that they witnessed something revolutionary, and this would mark the start of a golden age of surgery. Now even though Morton probably wasn't the first person to use ether as an anaesthetic, his successful operation can be credited with proving to the world that anaesthesia can be used safely and effectively. It was actually chloroform that would become popular in Europe the very next year, after it was introduced by the English obstetrician James Simpson because it caused less vomiting than ether when it was inhaled. Chloroform was used by the famous Dr. John Snow to assist in the birth of Queen Victoria's child in 1853, which was a widely publicised event, and made it so that the general public would accept the prospect of being anaesthetized. After the events of the Etherdome, 
a new field of doctors emerged who trained specifically as anaesthetists, and with the help of the development of the antiseptic technique by Joseph Lister, surgery would become a safer and painless experience. The complexity of operations that could be performed increased greatly from the 1860s onwards because surgeons could now be slow and methodical with the operations. Despite these previous advancements, anaesthesia was by no means finished with its development. Doctors found out that sometimes, you didn't need general anaesthesia for surgery, especially if it was a minor operation. This led to the introduction of local anaesthesia in the 1880s, and the first drug to be used for this purpose was none other than cocaine. It was first isolated from the South American coca plant in 1855, and was initially used for various purposes, like hunger suppression, as an energy stimulant, and even to treat morphine addiction. But a German ophthalmologist would discover the drug's effectiveness as a local anaesthetic after a rather gruesome experiment, in which he applied a solution of cocaine to his eye, and was able to prick the eye with a pin without flinching. This discovery would lead it to be administered for things like eye surgery, and was shockingly even used to treat toothache in children. But cocaine had toxic effects on the heart, and had a high potential for addiction, leading cocaine to be replaced by synthetic compounds that had a similar structure to it, such as procaine and lidocaine. Going back to general anaesthesia, the trio of nitrous oxide, ether and chloroform remained the mainstay of the field for nearly a hundred years, after which they were superseded by safer and more effective drugs, thus reducing the complications of surgery even further. The concepts that there was a triangle of anaesthesia would gain prominence in the 1940s, and from then on, it became standard for surgeries to use a combination of drugs. Nowadays in a typical surgery, an anaesthetist will use a strong analgesic to block any pain sensation, sedating agents that render a person unconscious, and lastly muscle relaxants, which paralyse the diaphragm and allows a ventilator to breathe for a patient. So the gradual evolution of anaesthesia has been key in transforming surgery from the unattractive branch of medicine that it once was, to the sophisticated and complex field that it is today. And anaesthesia has been proven to be important in other branches outside of surgery, as it also has its place in fields like dentistry, obstetrics, and intensive care medicine. Finally, the fact that many potentially harmful and currently illegal drugs are extremely prominent in the history of anaesthesia serves as a perfect example of how a drug that could be fatal to millions when used in a wrong way can end up saving millions when used correctly. <laughs>